Hello everyone, welcome again to yet another session of the NPTEL course, The History of English Language and Literature. Today's lecture is also a continuation of the previous lecture titled The Revival of Romance. We have been looking at the changing literary scene towards the end of the 18th century and also the various transitionary elements which were uh, also featuring as the forerunners of uh, the uh, upcoming romantic age of the 19th century. So, amidst the sweeping literary changes which were dominating the scene, uh, historically it was also a very significant, uh, uh, very significant time in terms of the politics, uh, culture and all the other related societal aspects. England was continuing to be ruled by the Hanoverian kings. The cabinet system of government had come into place and it was also going pretty strong in England. It was also a, a turbul it was also a time of turbulent political uh, affairs across the world and especially this period towards the end of the 18th century we witness the American war of independence which was uh, also to change the course of uh, the entire world history in the coming uh, centuries and decades. And this was also the time of the French revolutionary wars and also we have noted multiple times that the French revolution was a major influence in shaping the writing of many English writers of not just the end of the 18th century but also of the 19th century. This, uh, ti this period also featured the rise of Napoleon which again was to uh, redirect the course of political history into a different form altogether. And uh, when we uh, look at the state of England, it was also the age of hospitals and we also see the nation taking newer strides in terms of uh, the ways in which the state takes care of its citizens in a way that it was uh, hitherto unknown. And uh, notably, this was also the beginning of industrial revolution, though it was a very positive, uh, though it had a lot, lot of positive effects to begin with, it also was uh, the, it, it also led to a lot of uh, 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 counter results, uh, some of which we shall be taking a look at when we talk about the 19th century. Continuing our discussion from the previous uh, session, we uh, uh, take a look at three major poets who signaled a major transition towards the romantic age of the 19th century. They were Thomas Gray who lived from 1716 to 1771, Robert Burns from 1759 to 1796 and William Cooper who lived from 1731 till 1800. When we look at the time period in which they lived, we can say that they were all contemporaries and also heavily influenced by the uh, all of the things which were happening towards the end of the 18th century, in, not just in England but also in other parts of the world. When we look at the life and works of Thomas Gray, we begin to notice that his initial works were not uh, that of a, a romantic nature but they were in a way a continuation of the Augustan school. He was uh, heavily influenced by the works of Pope and Dryden and he begins writing these uh, versified pamphlets, two, was, two of which are uh, quite noted, uh, the address to ignorance and also the alliance of education and government. However, it said that both of these works remained incomplete and he did not go back to writing these kind of works uh, in the later stages. And, um, and in, the, in the next phase, we find him writing certain odes which were mostly lyri lyrical poems. Um, and this was also along the lines of Pope and Dryden and we find him composing quite a few uh, odes uh, such as uh, the one's title to the spring on a distant prospect on Eton College, a hymn to adversity, a hymn to ignorance. So, uh, there, were, uh, there were many more odes which he composed during this uh, period and most of, the, most of them were very conventional in terms of its uh, form and also in terms of uh, the treatment. Uh, of the poetic uh, quality and these were mostly fashioned on the basis of Dryden's lyrics who also had a major influence on the writings of uh, Thomas Gray especially during his initial days. But what, what made him depart from the existing traditional forms of writing was uh, the, uh, the composition of Elegy written in a country churchyard in 1751. And this work completely altered not just the career graph of Thomas Gray but also the way in which English literature uh, was beginning to be uh, fashioned. It was in a way refashioned in such a way that uh, the Augustan tenets which were dominating the 18th century poetry almost completely disappeared and we find the elegy setting new trends and also setting a new kind of standard in English literary writing. So, this particular work was uh, noted for um, uh, multiple uh, reasons and also this uh, signaled uh, the development of a distinctive romantic mood uh, in the, uh, by the end of the 18th century. So, there are 
four major elements which are highlighted in terms of uh, this uh, elegy which uh, came to be known as the elegy uh, throughout the 19th century. The first and foremost one was the use of nature as a background. Though the major theme of this work is related to the uh, impermanence of a man, the uh, most of the discussion happens in the background of nature. So, in that, that sense, there was a way in which nature was uh, being brought back to the discussion of the uh, discussion within the poetic realms. And uh, secondly, uh, he introduced the church he had seen, which uh, was uh, a very significant kind of uh, uh, development in the 18th century poetry and there was also a twilight atmosphere which gave a certain kind of a mood to this elegiac uh, writing. And thirdly, the uh, treatment as well as the tone of the poem was set to a, a brooding melancholy and fourthly, there was a very stark contrast being portrayed between the country and the town. If you remember, this was one of the most significant changes which uh, came into being towards the end of the 18th century as people were uh, getting increasingly weary of the artificial and the town centric poetry uh, dominated during uh, dominated by the Augustan writers. It said that the elegy was a result of Gray's thoughts following the death of uh, uh, co-poet Richard West in 1742. So, this uh, is a result of an intense kind of mourning that uh, uh, Gray had after the death. And this work initially it was uh, popularized by Horace Walpole uh, in the London circles and it was later published by Robert Dodsley. It became an instant literary sensation because it was a very new kind of poetry and a new kind of theme that uh, the, uh, uh, the people were getting. Uh, that the people were uh, receiving. The elegy became uh, quite popular in such a way that it almost became uh, synonymous to the identity of uh, uh, Thomas Gray. So, the first few lines are quite famous and oft quoted even in the contemporary. It goes like this, the curfew tolls a knell of parting day, the lowing herd wind slowly o'er the lee. The ploughman homeward plots his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. So, this continues to be quoted in uh, a lot of contexts whenever there is a discussion related to death, a parting, etc. And it also was significantly uh, engraved into a lot of uh, uh, memorials about uh, uh, Thomas Gray. The first line of the poem, it almost became very significant in identifying not just the poet, but even this age of transition. And uh, we continue to see that uh, a lot of uh, phrases were uh, borrowed into English language from this uh, elegy. Uh, for example, certain phrases such as the paths of glory, celestial fire, some mute inglorious men, far from the madding crowd, which incidentally was uh, also borrowed by Thomas Hardy for the title of his novel at a later point, the unlettered muse and the kindred spirit. All of these uh, phrases which were used uh, in, uh, in, in Gray's elegy became part of uh, various kinds of expressions in English language. And in, in that sense, it is also uh, important to uh, take a look at the kind of humour that Gray portrayed in some of his works. For example, uh, in uh, one of his odes on a distant prospect of Eton College, there is a famous line which was oft quoted and even misquoted in multiple uh, contexts even later. Uh, uh, where ignorance is bliss, it is folly to be wise. Though the elegy was hugely popular and was considered as one of the most important works of uh, Gray, it was only a stage of his uh, career uh, in the sense that at a later point, we do not find Gray continuing to write any kind of poetry in that mood. He also became increasingly romantic as he uh, grew older. So, most of his later works were could be classified among the uh, poets of the romantic uh, century. In one of his works, uh, The Progress of Poesy and the Bard, he even clarifies that the poet is not a product of genius, but he is an inspired singer. He is an enthusiast rather than a wit. This was in stark contrast with the dominant views of uh, poet and poetry, which was uh, uh, held during the Augustan uh, times and it in that sense could be seen as an antithesis of the predominant 18th century conventions about uh, writings, about poetry and about uh, art and artist in general. And in uh, uh, a couple of other uh, works that followed the fatal sister and the descent of Auden, he also talks about the kind of Celtic uh, revival which was uh, uh, dominating the 18th century scene. This also needs to be read alongside the medieval, uh, the interest in the medieval ages and the revival of uh, medievalism in the 18th century. So, he also composes these poems which are primarily about the northern and Celtic uh, themes. So, in that sense, we do not find him being confined to what is uh, considered a standard in English literature, but also moves out of these uh, boundaries and these uh, 
we also see him moving out of these boundaries. He also had composed a mock elegy on the death of Horace Walpole's death, which was also a source of much humor during those days. It was titled Ode on the Death of a Favorite Cat Drowned in a Tub of Goldfishes. Samuel Johnson once wrote about him that he spoke in two languages, the language of public and private. This was uh, what made him quite enduring to the uh, readers of those times because it was not removed from their reality. It also was uh, the kind of poetry which was uh, closer to their heart and closer in a way that uh, the artificial poetry of the Augustan uh, period uh, could not uh, achieve. So, if we try to sum up Gray's influence uh, during this transition phase from the 18th century uh, dry artificial uh, wit towards the 19th century romantic mode, uh, we find much evidence of uh, this uh, transition in uh, Gray's general poetic career. As Hudson notes it, he began with versified, versified pamphlets in Pope's manner, passed on through conventional lyrics to the elegy and ended with experiments which are fundamentally romantic in character. Having said that, we now move on to take a look at the life and works of Robert Burns, who uh, could be seen as uh, quite a different kind of a person from that of uh, uh, Thomas Gray. He also was of a Scottish, uh, he was a Scottish uh, person and he was endowed with a spontaneous power of genius. So, this is also one of those instances where we find English literature uh, in, uh, in, in, a, in a certain way. Uh, so, sort of uh, benefiting a lot from not just English writers, but also from write writers of Scottish origin. Though he was a peasant, it is uh, uh, many historians are of the opinion that it would be quite a mistake to regard him as an unlettered ploughman. He was received as an equal by his contemporaries and other men of letters and he was also a guest at many aristocratic gatherings in the 18th century. So, in a society which was quite ridden by these hierarchical structures for a peasant to be considered as an equal among these other men of letters, he certainly must have been a man of uh, very rare and true genius. In terms of his poetry, his ancestry was mo mostly Scottish and it could be uh, even, uh, it could be even uh, concluded that his uh, poetic genius was uh, influenced in uh, only in very little ways by the standard English literature. But however, one of his earliest works, uh, The Quarter Saturday Night, uh, does show a profound influence of uh, Spencer. It was written in the Spencerian uh, stanza. But apart from that, it also reflected the general political uh, temperament of the period as well. We find a strong democratic quality coming through his writings. He also contrasted the homely life and the simple piety of the peasant with the wealth and the vulgar ostentation, the luxury and the artificial refinements of the uh, fashionable world. So, in that sense, we also find him moving away from the pleasures of the town centric life towards a more uh, rustic nature centric depiction. He was majorly influenced by the songs and ballads of the Scottish uh, peasant folk and we do not find him believing uh, in, uh, in a taught kind of poetry or in a trained kind of poetry and we do not find him showing any inclination to follow or imitate the great masters of the ancient uh, period. He uh, is said to have brought back a uh, natural passion into English verse and also many of his writings as well as his personal convictions, they, they show a very strong faith in the dominant political tenets of those times uh, uh, that of liberty, equality and fraternity. Robert Burns interestingly is considered as the national poet of uh, Scotland. He was also chosen as the greatest Scot in, uh, in an opinion poll conducted as recently as 2009. He was, uh, he is generally considered as a pioneer of the romantic movement though he lived in the 18th century and uh, one of his, um, uh, one of his uh, folk uh, uh, kind of uh, poetry, uh, O Lang Syne, it was set to a folk tune and published in 1788. It continues to be traditionally used as a song to bid farewell to the old year at the stroke of midnight. It also has been a significant part of popular culture even in the contemporary times. He also wrote a number of poems uh, such as To a Louse, To a Mouse, The Battle of Sharamur and A Red Red Rose which continues to be one of the most significant poems of the 18th century. And the poem A Red Red Rose is must, much quoted, it is part of popular culture, it is also considered as a major influence which, uh, uh, which uh, went uh, beyond the national, national boundaries and was uh, quite translated and quite used in many parts of uh, Europe then and even at a later point. Summing up the influence of uh, Walter Scott once wrote, his person was strong and robust, his manners rustic, not clownish. 
a sort of dignified plainness and simplicity which received part of its effect perhaps from knowledge of his extraordinary talents. I never saw such another eye in a human head though I have seen the most distinguished men of my time. With this to move, we move to another very significant writer William Cooper who could be uh, who, in whom we can find a stark contrast with Burns. But however, irrespective of the kind of differences that they uh, might have borne in terms of their personal and their literary talents, they are quite closer to each other in terms of literary history. And uh, William Cooper, keeping in tune with the uh, true spirit of romanticism that was to follow, he wrote poetry just to express his own ideas and did not believe in pruning it through uh, with the help of rules or regulations. His most influential and the most significant work is entitled The Task. And in this poem, he abandons uh, traditions and it, he takes an independent course and we do not find him imitating or even uh, being overtly influenced by any of the earlier writers. The Task was a long blank verse poem and this poem is generally considered as a masterpiece, masterpiece of later 18th century evangelicalism. So, it is also useful to remember that William Cooper was heavily influenced by the uh, ideas of evangelicalism and he was also a radical evangelist uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in a certain way. And his work was even compared to that of Paradise Lost in terms of the fervor, uh, pa and fervor and the passion that it displayed. Cooper was heavily influenced by certain narrow religious uh, uh, teachings of the sects that he believed in. But however, in his work we find him transcending the sectarian limitations. And uh, also there was this uh, major complaint about uh, the task uh, that it was extremely discursive, uh, rambling and wholly wanting in a proper structure. But nevertheless, we find him contributing significantly to the development of English language as well through certain uh, very innovative kind of uh, proverbial sayings such as God made the country and man made the town. God moves in mysterious way, his wonders to perform. So, in his writings also we find him drawing a stark contrast between the town centric life and the rustic life that many of the late 18th century poets and the 19th century poets seem to prefer. He shared an amazing friendship with John Newton who was much uh, uh, famous for the as the author of the hymn The Amazing Grace and with Newton he is also said to have uh, shared a very deep relationship which influenced each other's uh, work and writings as well. Overall it is possible to say that William Cooper changed the direction of 18th century uh, poetry and among all the other later 18th century poets he was the one who came the closest to that of the genius of Wordsworth. Critics are of diverse opinion uh, when it comes to this. Uh, some of them feel that he is a premonition of Wordsworth while the others argue that he is a premonition of Byron. Uh, but it is possible to say that he uh, perhaps foreshadowed both of them Wordsworth and Byron because he had a certain sense of sympathetic handling of uh, rural life in his work and in his passion and also there were indications of social unrest that we could read into his works just like uh, uh, just like uh, Byron's work turned out to be at a later point. We find Cooper denouncing a number of abuses during his uh, lifetime such as militarism and slave trade and significantly soon after uh, his uh, poetic denunciation of uh, the uh, the prison of uh, Bastille which was seen as a symbol of uh, uh, tyranny and irresponsible authority uh, across Europe. Uh, we find that the fall of Bastille happens in 1789, four years uh, after the publication of the task. And this event as we know it also, it also was considered as a flashpoint of uh, the French Revolution. Another more lasting uh, impact that he left was the publication of uh, a short poem, The Negro's Complaint in 1788. It was the complaint from the viewpoint of the slave uh, and, and also he had heavily and uh, quite vehemently uh, written against slave trade which was dominating the 18th century and even the early uh, early 19th century. And it is also useful to remember that amidst all of these uh, things the colonialism and uh, the overseas trade was a significant um, uh, was a significant development which was happening and this uh, also was a political need of the hour. So, we do find that a lot of thinkers such as uh, Cooper and the many others who followed they had a lot of differential opinions about the uh, political stances and the political uh, policies that uh, uh, especially the colonial policies that the British government was uh, uh, taking. But nevertheless we also find that there was a more freedom for these writers to critique and also to write against the uh, evils that they thought right against the policies that they thought were inherently evil. And this uh, poem com coming back to this poem the Negro's uh, complaint was oft quoted by Martin Luther King and uh, this, uh, this poem was also seen as one of those works which uh, 
uh, signaled a transition as well as enabled other similarly oppressed people to talk against such kind of repressive authority. If we try to evaluate the literary context in which uh, Cooper was placed, it would be useful to quote uh, Hudson again. Uh, he notes, when Cooper was born, Pope was at the height of his power. When he died, Burns had been four years in his grave and the lyrical ballads two years before the world. So, in that sense, he is the perhaps the perfect transitionary poet who uh, entirely uh, caught the uh, best of the outgoing world and also what is yet to come in the uh, coming world. In that sense, Coleridge also talks about him as the best modern poet. So, all these three poets together, they signaled and completed the transition from the 18th century towards the 19th century romanticism. And when we move on to discuss the 19th century poets and the tenets of romanticism, we also will begin to recognize and realize that the transition was made smoother perhaps by, with the intervention of these major poets. And if we look ahead uh, to the 19th century and also the ways in which it moves away, it departs away from the tenets of the Augustan, uh, from, the tenets, uh, from the tenets of the 18th century Augustan world, uh, we notice that there is a uh, very radical shift in the view of nature and the function of poetry. There is also a celebration of the liberation of poetry also getting uh, replicated in the major socio-political events of the period as well. And we also find that the uh, there is a way in which the poet's role itself gets uh, redefined and reshaped. There, there is a focus on the dual purpose of pleasure and edification and also a focus on the expression of the poet's emotion. We also find that poetry is no longer limited to the refined civilized group. This uh, also finds its culmination in uh, the Romantic Age with the publications by Wordsworth and Coleridge. We also find that there is a celebration of the imitation of human nature and the value of there is a uh, way in which more stress is placed on the value of life in an urban industrial society. And overall looking ahead we see a sense of change and also the impossibility of uh, keeping static. And all of these things we also begin to notice at a later point that all of these things together it made possible the romantic revolution to happen in the 19th century. So, on that note of anticipation we begin to wrap up today's lecture. Thank you for listening and I look forward to meeting all of you in the next session.